Good morning, everybody. I am Ginger Dwee. I'm the executive director of Bike East Bay, and I'm just super stoked to talk to you today about bikes, transit, and how to do what moves you. I, I'm like constantly surprised by the position I find myself in as the executive, executive director of Bike East Bay, <laughs> and I just want to share a little bit of that journey today, just how someone who went from basically really loving bikes, here's me on my tall bike, to running a, a bike nonprofit and being a really part of this amazing bike movement, working for a more sustainable and equitable future for all of us through transit. So what I wanna talk to you today is, you know, the first part is like, hey, how I just did what moved me, literally bikes and following my own path, turning side gigs and hobby into a career, and then talking a little bit about how transit has played a big role through my life. And part of that is because I want to show you like where I started here in Hong Kong. Uh, my family's from Hong Kong. I spent my first six years there. And this photo just really captures like my memories and my, my experience of being in Hong Kong, just tons of people and also a ton of transit. Everybody in Hong Kong basically gets around by transit and one of the reasons is that it's way too crowded to have a car and it's also really expensive. Like, I believe there's at least 100% tax on a car. So if you, if you get your BMW or your Porsche or whatever they're driving around, it costs twice as much. The overwhelming majority of people get around by transit and it's just this incredible, incredible transit ecosystem. I think of it as a coral reef. If you look at, you know, if you can squint your eyes, imagine this picture is like a coral reef. People are getting around by bus, trolley, these little mini buses, which are great, taxis, ferries, subway, rail, and even now high-speed rail. And basically, if you can't get there by public transit, that place doesn't exist. One thing that makes Hong Kong really cool is it's a really good place to be old. My grandparents were in Hong Kong for, for quite a while, and my parents also got really excited about getting, being able to get the senior fare in Hong Kong, you know, when they go back to, to visit, uh, the senior bus fare is like Hong Kong $2, which is literally 25 cents. And combined with this really dense and walkable city and transit system where you can get everywhere, it's just a really great place to be an old person. So what growing up in Hong Kong for, for half of my childhood informed was seeing the possibility of what transit can be. And that also informs like my experience as a a person in the bike advocacy uh, movement. But really, who, who am I? This is actually my happy place. You know, my happy place is unfortunately no, no longer a super, super dense and crowded place like Hong Kong. I grew up mostly in Southern California and I've actually spent a lot of time in the outdoors now. Uh, my background is not in anything transportation or wonky at all. My academic training was actually in biology studying the ecology and evolution of California plants. And it's just been this really strange and wild ride to going from like quitting grad school and getting into bike advocacy. One indication that things were going the wrong way was I was actually spending a lot of time in grad school on the computer. My specialty was like using DNA sequences to figure out the evolution of all these really cool plants in California. And I was just like, I wasn't doing field work. I was just on the computer programming and, and you know, getting back pain and all that stuff. And I thought, okay, I need to figure out a way to be able to like mountain bike to my field sites and it's gonna be great. And you know, a couple, couple months and then a couple years of thinking about this, I was like, you know what? I just need to quit grad school. So I did <laughs> and I got on my bike and I rode my bike around Mexico for, for like three months. And, and when I came back to the Bay Area, I got a job. I started working at different bike nonprofits. And one of the first ones that I landed at is a really cool organization called the Bay Area Outreach and Recreation Program called BORP. They do sports and recreation for people with disabilities. And I, it's, it was just like my favorite job ever. I worked at the Adaptive Cycling Center where we just had this huge barn full of all kinds of different bikes. Whatever kind of the way that your body moves or doesn't move, we had a bike for you or, or we would figure it out. And that was just such an incredible experience that opened my eyes to like, there's just no limits to people, people being able to move our bodies. It could be... It could be a physical barrier that we can like 
get you to do something, an adaptive piece of equipment to get you going, or it could be a mental barrier that we can get you there with just support and community. And uh, I just want to like point out this really rad bike I'm, I'm test riding here. It's a side-by-side -side tandem, which is also electric. And it was purchased by someone whose wife had cancer and, and you know, they used to ride their bikes together a lot. And in, as her cancer progressed, she wasn't able to ride a regular bike. But with this bike, the couple were able to ride together uh, even through the progression of her, of her disease. And when they didn't need it anymore, uh, they donated to Borp where we could pass it on to all kinds of other folks. And it was just, just really cool, really cool vehicle. And just one of like hundreds and hundreds of different bikes for any, any kind or any kind of disability or, or, or body that you have. Just this, this work with Borp led to a lot of cool things, you know. For one, I became a little bit of an expert on cycling and disability. And I was able, uh, at my job at Bike East Bay, I was able to sit on the Metro Metropolitan Transportation Commission's bike share, adaptive bike share technical advisor committee. So how do we have this bike share system that has come to Oakland? How can we make it accessible also for people with disabilities? So I was able to sit on that, be all wonky, um, I also got to do some really cool thing, which is make this really beautiful film with the Lighthouse for the Blind. And I'm just going to play a little clip from that. There's definitely risk involved. You're going down some pretty fast hills. You're going around curves. You don't know what's coming. The more you ride with somebody, the more you have that kind of built trust that you've been through something together and you know that it's going to work out okay. Something that I love about it is so like, I've been riding with my friend Mark, who is blind for oh almost a decade now. And the you know my opportunity through Bork just led to being able to make this little film with the Lighthouse for the Blind that just like really showed our friendship for each other. And it's really come through riding the bike, riding bikes together for so long. Just a lovely opportunity that came my way because of what I was doing in in the bike bike world. So I'm working at Borp, I'm working at like, I actually like was working at multiple different bike nonprofits at the same time. Eventually got a job at Bike East Bay as their membership manager. And while I was doing this, so one of the reasons I, I left grad school was like, oh man, I'm just sick of sitting in front of the computer. I gotta get out in this world. I promised myself my next job, you know, no more computers, no more cubicles, but you know, here I am still in front of a computer. I was trying to figure out a way out, you know, like how do I get out of here? One of the ways that I tried to get out <laughs> was, I, I had this dream, I have this dream of like writing a travel guide to transit-based bike adventures, bike camping adventures around the Bay Area and beyond. You know, I, I, I have a science background. I don't have like a writing background at all. So I was like, all right, I got to figure out how to write. <laughs> so I can, I can like eventually write a book and get a lot more people out there. So I started keeping this blog, flamingbike.com and posting all of these different adventures, maps, tips, phot photography, suggestions. And it's just been building into this, into this like really cool resource for folks to get out there. And, and I'm showing you this, this map here. All of these little links here go to blog posts, like for example, this Henry Co trip, Henry Co wildflower overnight. How do you get to this awesome state park, Henry Co, by transit, where to ride there and bring in that like biology background? What kind of like really cool spring wildflowers are you gonna see out there? So this has just been like a really fantastic little side project to develop my voice as a writer and also kind of, it got me into like all kinds of other hobbies as well, you know, photography. Um, I got a really fancy camera and was taking all these pictures and I still haven't written the darn book because, you know, I was doing all this stuff and it, it kind of got me a promotion to becoming communications director at Bike East Bay. You know, I was doing a lot more writing at my job. People were seeing the work I was putting together on my blog and they were like, well, I, I guess I advocated myself, hey, we need a communications director and I am the person for your job. So I got the job, I'm starting to write a lot more things. Unfortunately, doing a lot of writing and you know, graphic design and whatever at work totally burned me out. I still haven't read, written the book. If any of you out there are, wants to partner on the book, Hit, hit me up. I'm, I'm still passionate about it. So as a communications director at Bike East Bay, one of the really cool things I got to do was really help us articulate our stance around social justice, 
racial justice and transportation justice. As a bike movement, I mean, the bike movement is is super white. I am one of the very few people of color in leadership positions in bike advocacy organizations across the U.S. And that comes from a, a really white dominant movement. And that's, that's problematic because of the limited lens that people of privilege, people from a dominant demographic have. And one of the things that the bike movement has really had to do over the past, whatever, five years is respond to challenges by um, people coming from the social justice world and saying, hey, you know, like bike lanes are coming in to parts of town and uh, it looks like gentrification to people. Bike share comes in. Who is this system for? Is it for like people commuting to San Francisco um, to white collar jobs? Or is this system actually for everybody in the community to, to black and brown members of the community, to low income communities? And that's been really important. I was really part of the work at Bike East Bay to develop our voice and to develop our strategies for making biking more accessible and building a more equitable transportation system. And I'm just really proud of that part of my work. You know, bringing in my perspective as a person of color within a white dominant movement, putting together like, hey, what does it sound like and feel like when Bike East Bay talks about equity? So a couple of years of this and suddenly I found myself as executive director. And that just, it just really blows my mind that I turned this love for bikes. I just love, you know, I get up and I want to ride bikes. You know, I go for a bike ride and somehow here I am. I rode my bike to the top of the nonprofit ladder, but I, I like to, I'd like to think that I got a head start by riding a tall bike, you know, it was, it was a little bit ahead of the game there. So I just want to switch gears a little bit to talk about Bike East Bay and what we do. Bike East Bay, our, our mission is to promote healthy and sustainable communities by making biking safe, fun, and accessible. And we do a lot of grassroots organizing. We are backed by over 4,000 members, uh, all kinds of volunteers and community leaders. And we're, built, we're building this movement so that you, you too can become a champion for better bicycling in a more just and equitable transportation system. And where all of this comes from, I mean, a lot of us who work at Bike East Bay or, or volunteers at Bike East Bay, you know, we're really passionate about, about biking, love bikes, love all kinds of wacky bikes. But there's also this social and societal problem where that we're trying to fix, which is there's, there's been a huge cost of designing cities for cars, designing cities to move cars as, fast, as, as many cars as possible as fast as possible. And this, this is actually like baked in to guidelines for how you design streets until very recently, until the last couple of years. Like if your street design slowed down traffic, it was not going to pass environmental review. So if you wanted to put in anything like a dedicated bus lane, a dedicated bike lane, maybe like widen your sidewalks, if it slowed down cars or it created more congestion, it was, it was not gonna get built or maybe it was gonna be a lot more expensive because you had to get these exemptions or whatever. So part of, the, part of the work of bike advocacy in California has been to change state law. So that instead of like providing state guidance for like how streets are built to move cars as fast as possible, now one of the guidance is to re- reduce your street change has to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled uh, in an effort to reduce greenhouse gases, for example. So that's one example of the advocacy that advocates around the state have done. But back to back to the cost of car-centric cities, there are a lot of problems with uh, designing cities built for cars. We have traffic violence, you know, people getting hit by cars. There's pollution and greenhouse gas emissions contributing to climate change. There's congestion, you know, like all the time we spend sp- sitting in traffic uh, and also physical in- inactivity. And all of this is experienced inequitably by black and brown communities and by low income communities. What you're, you're seeing here is a picture of the MacArthur maze. I think this is our, our sewage plant, which is cool. I, I, I think sewage plants are really cool. I want to go take a tour of it. But you, know, you take, take the freeway, this way goes, goes to the Bay Bridge, that, this way goes through Oakland. You know, these freeways were built by, by bodo, bulldozing communities, thriving communities in West Oakland, thriving black communities, the black downtown in West Oakland. So freeways 
well documented it's been used to actually segregate communities and to you know photos over quote unquote undesirable communities so transportation planning and and transit is not race neutral there is a really deep history of inequitable plan planning and like deliberate racist policies and part of the work that i get to do at bike east bay is looking at how we can undo the harm that has been done um, by racist planning policies in the past and also really shine a light on our own work as bike advocates like our is what we're doing uh, really equitable? Are we taking a social justice lens with, with advocacy work that we do? Um, and it just makes me really passionate because I actually get to do work to build the sustainable and equitable world that I want to see. At Bike East Bay, uh, we're actually really, we're a small and mighty team. Uh, someone at Oakdale actually said to me, like, hey, you guys really punch above your weight. And I'm like, that's right. We, we're seven people on staff right now, uh, 4,000 members. We cover two counties, Alameda County and Contra Costa County, which has really diverse demographics and geographies, right? You have a dense urban core, outlying suburbs, and also rural areas. And there are these really complex dynamics of like gentrification from the urban core to that, to you know the the suburbs where we have actually rising poverty, um, and also these long distance commutes between these um, two areas. So it's a really interesting challenge for us to find ways to build walkable, bikeable, public transitable, and equitable cities across this diverse region. And what we do to get there is through advocacy education and community. So I'm actually gonna start backwards from this. I'll start with community. Um, it, we have lots of member events and also a lot of public events. And one of my favorite every year, unfortunately we weren't able to do it, is Pedal Fest. That's our one day festival at Jack London Square celebration of all things bike. This is my favorite part of Pedal Fest, our amphibious bike race. And it just pleases me to all end that um, one of my what, one of the things that I do as a job is to like encourage ridiculous behavior at the, as this. So hopefully we can bring Pedal Fest back in the future. We love public events because it shows people biking is fun. People get, get into it because uh, of this kind of social element. Wow, that's really cool. I want to ride a bike. Then they ride a bike and then they're riding to school or work and suddenly they're bike advocates. It's amazing. Another thing that we do is we teach about 3,500 people every year how to ride in the city with confidence. And we teach uh, over 150 free bike ed classes. So if you are thinking of getting on a bike or, or getting uh, more comfortable riding in the city, I encourage you to, encourage you to go to bikeyspay.org slash education uh, to sign up for our free class. Uh, because of the pandemic, we have a ton of free online classes on all kinds of topics from how to change the flow, uh, bike mechanics, and we also just started reopening our in-person classes. So I'm just gonna show you a really quick clip from our urban cycling day two class, uh, just to show you what you can get all for free. Uh, throughout the day, we've gone over some other more on bike skills, such as emergency quick stop, emergency turn, how to ride in a straight line and signal or look over your shoulder and a bunch of other drills in a parking lot. Super great. But really probably what you know us for and what our, our members and all kinds of supporters know us for is bringing world-class bicycle infrastructure to the East Bay. We know that one of the number one barriers to people getting on a bike in the city is we don't feel safe. We don't feel safe riding in traffic. Again, that's because our cities are actually built to move cars and, and not to move people, you know, move people by biking, walking, or for taking public transit. And that's one of our big things is reimagining what our cities could be could look like if we really prioritize moving people over um, over death machines. <laughs> what way we do that, what we know is we really need a network of low stress bikeways, for example, like this one in downtown Oakland, which is the Telegraph Avenue protected bike lane. We have been advocating for this for uh, almost, I think over almost a decade at this point. Uh, during the pandemic, we opened the next, Oakland opened the new section in Temescal. Um, 
and we're hoping to connect it and make it a connected protected bikeway all the way from downtown Oakland and eventually to downtown Berkeley. This is really new stuff and change is really hard. Change is hard for people. We have, uh, we always get a ton of pushback from the community. People are afraid of losing parking. Um, hey, what, what's, what's happening to my street? And one of the fun things that Bike East Bay we get to do is bring this vision to the community. Uh, and we do, these, do this through demonstration bikeways. So we actually get our volunteers out onto the street and reconfigure the streets so that people can actually try it out, ride, ride on it, park the cars in it, see how it feels to have these world-class bikeways on the street. This is a picture from our 2016 Sunday Berkeley Streets pop-up protected bikeway on Hearst Avenue. This is really interesting because uh, Berkeley City Council was making the decision on whether to extend a protected bikeway onto this very block. And so we were like, all right, we want this. We want it all the way going to Shattuck and we're gonna show the people what it looks like. So we had our volunteers get up at the crack of dawn, break out the duct tape, and uh, we built this protected bikeway. And I'm gonna show you a video clip now of um, what it looks like to ride through this protected bikeway. This is Hearst Street, Hearst Ave actually, in Berkeley, riding Bikey Space's latest parking protected bike lane. It's Berkeley Sunday streets, beautiful sunny day as usual. Everybody's loving it. We're heading up towards Shattuck. And, and the result of this pop-up bikeway was we, we got tons of support from the neighbors who came out to check out the pop-up bikeway, signed our petition. We sent that off to the city council and they approved it. And uh, if you go ride Hearst Avenue today, you'll see that the street looks very similar to this pop-up that we created for Sunday streets. Um, just instead of uh, duct tape and cardboard on the ground, we now have actual thermal plastic striping. So really fun event that activated volunteers and, and that grassroots energy that resulted in actual on the ground changes that has improved, improved your ride. Uh, so what's, what's next for Bike East Bay? Uh, here's a picture of actually the, a portion a little bit to the east of the protected bikeway I just showed you. This is also Hearst Ave and what's showing is this green part is a protected bike lane going uphill and here's a bus boarding island and this really the integration of in transit is really the next step. Uh, how can we, Bike East Bay actually does a ton of advocacy for transit because we know in order to have um, more sustainable transportation, we need to look at the, the transportation system overall, you know, like we're in our bike lane and like we want people to get everywhere. And sometimes you just don't want a bike, you know, all the way to Richmond or all the way across town, or maybe it's raining, you know, people need options. We also know that people who bike are more likely to take the bus and also vice versa. It's all about the network. And how can we get bikes and buses to play well together? If you ride regularly, you know, just really, um, annoying to terrifying situation is when you're like going about the same pace as a bus and you're, you're hopscotching each other. And that's just really not a great interaction. So we're trying to separate these two modes, give everybody their own space. So um, bikes are able to just like, woo, we take, we have our own lane and the bus has, buses have their own lane. And actually because the bus doesn't have to weave in and out of traffic to the curbside bus stop as much, uh, loading gets much faster. Um, and the buses actually run more efficiently. Transit is, we're doing a ton of transit advocacy at Bike East Bay right now because the pandemic has had such an impact on transit, both bus fares going down, BART fares going down, um, and people you know, being, being concerned about riding on transit. Uh, we really need to save our transit system. Uh, the federal funds for, uh, for funding our local transit is running out. Um, once that runs out, AC Transit is going to have to cut uh, a lot of the lines, and that is going to disproportionately impact low-income people who really depend on getting the bus to get around. And if we lose these like really critical lines, people are going to get out of the habit of using transit. They're not going to come back, and we're going to uh, head more in the direction of people using cars to get around all all the time instead of you know more sustainable modes. Uh, Daniel mentioned like, hey, I'm, I'm like getting out there and where are all these people going on, on in their cars? And 
you know, we are back to pre-pandemic levels of congestion on our on our streets, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of that is because people aren't taking public transit. So, Bike is Face doing a lot of work uh, to get out the vote on really important ballot measures, including for Prop 15 in California. So, this is Prop 15, schools and community first. It's a partial reform of Prop 13, that really terrible property tax law. It's going to provide funding for schools, public transit, and community services. And really crucially for us in Alameda County, it's going to help close the budget gap from uh, COVID-19 and, and deliver a lot of funds to maintaining AC transit. So what we're doing is uh, organizing Bikey Spay volunteers, and you can be one too, to phone bank for Yes on 15. We've got uh, two more two more phone banking nights coming up. So if you go to bikeyspay.org, volunteer. Uh, you can get dialed in there. You know, my closing thought is I really want you to do what moves you. I found myself in this amazing career because I just kept following what I love. I still do what I love, ride bikes. You know, I get up every morning and ride bikes. I didn't this morning because I had to get up early for you all. But, you know, over a decade ago, I clicked the volunteer button on the Bikey Spay page and started this ride that turned my bike love into a career. And uh, you know, whatever, whatever your, whatever it is that moves you, I think it's going to, you've probably already found and you'll find that it takes you in unexpected directions. Turn out really a lot of fun. So if you're into biking, want to see a sustainable and equitable world, I encourage you to come to our webpage, join or renew your membership, uh, sign up to volunteer. If you're new to biking and want to get, uh, get super powered on that, take a free class and you're, Hopefully someone will start your journey um, into this, this bike movement and really someone's got to take over the ship after me. So maybe you next. Thanks, Jerk. Thank you so much.